Uh, welcome everyone to the first lecture of the series Bioinformatics for Schoolers. The series is titled as Introduction to Genetics and Genomics. Before we get into what is genetics and genomics, let's ask a simple question. What makes something living? So you would have seen this. This is a sponge. And this is also a sponge which lives in the ocean. So what makes this non-living versus this living? The simple answer is if we zoom into this, it will be made of many tiny cells. And something that is living can also make many copies of itself while it is alive. So a cell is the functional unit of life, which means that a cell itself is enough to be called as alive. And there are different types of cells. One type is called as a prokaryotic cell. It is a very primitive, simple type, which will have a cell body with uh, something called as the genetic material. And in the case of eukaryotic cell, there are many subcompartments. It's a bit more complex. One of the subcompartments is called as nucleus, and it has a hereditary genetic material. Now, the hereditary genetic material of each cell or any organism is called as genome. And now we also know that the genome can be made of either deoxyribonucleic acid or DNA or ribonucleic acid or RNA. Cells can also be unicellular or multicellular. For example, bacteria, protease, and yeast, they remain as single cells with the genetic material. Whereas in the case of uh, multicellular life, the cells will start organizing into different levels. They can first make tissues, then organs, then organ systems, and then they'll all the organ system collectively will make an organism. For example, you all know immune cells. These are cells which fight germs which enter your body. So when many immune cells can get together with other cell types, such as red blood cells, you know that these are cells which carry oxygen. So when these different cell types come together, they form a tissue called as blood. Now, blood itself flows through something called as a blood vessel. These can be arteries or veins. And these form together an organ system called as the circulatory system. Now, different organ systems combinedly form an organism. In this case, these, these organisms can be called as vertebrates. They can be fishes, mice, humans, or monkeys. Interestingly, even the single cellular organisms can just sit side by side to each other and interact with each other and form a biofilm. And we'll talk about biofilms later on when we talk about the human body. So where did life start? About 4 billion years ago, there was like a soup on the surface of Earth called a primordial soup. These had different elements like carbon and hydrogen and other components like water vapor and ammonia which all under the high temperature and high pressure condi conditions reacted together to form the first building blocks of life, such as DNA, RNA, or something called as amino acids, which make up proteins. So this idea that this is how life started forming on Earth was put together by two different scientists called as Opar, uh, two different scientists, Oparin and Haldane, and this is called as oparin haldane hypothesis. This idea was then proved experimentally in the laboratory by two, two scientists, Miller and Urey. If you're interested, there's also a board game called as a primordial soup. So you can scan this board to read more about this game. Uh, basically, in this game, you will get the different components present in the primordial soup, and you can make your own life forms as the game progresses. Another hypothesis is that RNA was the first genetic material which was formed in the primordial soup and the DNA slowly evolved from RNA. So we have been talking about DNA and RNA. So how do they look at uh, look like at the molecular level? So the DNA looks like a double helix, like a ladder. And these ladder rungs are formed by something called as base pairs. So there are two bases, one from one strand, another from the other strand. And they are joined together at the middle. And uh, the strands are made of sugars and phosphates. And these bases are thymine, cytosine, adenine, and guanine. And these, this is how they look chemically 
at the molecular level. In the case of RNA, it is a single strand, again made of sugar and phosphates, but the bases are uracil, cytosine, adenine, and guanine. So simply put it, the DNA is made of ATGC letters and the RNA is made of AUGC letters. So a gene is a functional unit of the hereditary material. That is, it is the smallest part of the hereditary material which has a role by itself. And the genome is a collection of all the genes of the organism. So DNA and RNA together make gene and the collection of genes will make the genome. The study of individual genes we call as genetics and the study of the entire genome we call as genomics. So do you think that across different organisms, the genome sizes are the same? And you know the answer, it is going to be no. So if you take a small organism like a virus, the number of bases or base pairs are around 1000. And as the size of the organism and the complexity of the organism increases, the size of the genome also increases. And now if you ask where humans lie on this spiral, you can see that the human genome size is around 3.3 to 3.2 to 3.3 billion base pairs. So that means billion has about nine zeros. After three, there are nine zeros. That many number of chemical letters are part of our DNA. So how does this huge DNA sit inside a small cell? So there are, there are differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes again. So a prokaryotic cell is usually one to five microns, which means that there is 10 raised to the power minus six meters as the size of the cell. And there can be a single circular chromosomal DNA and plasmid DNA. So this is like an example of a bacteria. In the case of a eukaryotic cell, there are many chromosomes. The DNA is arranged as many chromosomes. And the cell size is about 10 to 100 micrometers. The nucleus size is 5 to 10 micrometers. And all of these chrom chromosomes condense together to form chromatin. And it is packed into the nucleus and then into the cell. So you can look at human chromosomes like a pair of socks. So each chromosome has... Uh, there are two copies of each chromosome and there are 22 copies uh, plus there are uh, sex chromosomes. So in male, it would be X and Y sex chromosome and in females, it would be two copies of the X chromosome. So this is how the human genome looks like. Now, how, how like we again ask, how does all of this pack into the small cell which we can't even see with our eyes? That is through something called as a chromosome organization. So in the case of a human cell, three billion bases have to be fit inside six micrometers. And if we actually take a DNA in a human cell and stretch it out, it will be almost two meters long. So this is, uh, this is done by something called as a beads on string model, like the DNA is taken and wound around proteins. So we can see here that DNA is a double helix, which then looks like a rope is then bound around proteins. Then the proteins themselves are, proteins with the DNA are themselves bound and bound and bound until they compact into something called as a chromosome. And then the 23 pairs of chromosomes are packed in, in, into the nucleus. So like with any factory, we can think of cell as a factory. There are many rules of a factory, how a factory runs. So the cell also has a rule and that is called as a central dogma of biology which means that the DNA will make RNA, which will make protein. So the first step of this uh, rule is that replication. It is called as replication, which the DNA, how does DNA make more copies of itself? That is called as replication. It, the more DNA is made of something called as deoxyribonucleotides, which we earlier called as ATGC. And it is made by a protein called as DNA polymerase. So more of DNA can be made from itself. The next step is called as transcription. That is, messenger RNA is made from DNA. That is, the DNA has an information on how to run a cell. So that message is copied onto a molecule called as RNA using small parts called as ribonucleotides, which we earlier simplified as AUGC. And this is done by a protein called as RNA polymerase. Now, from the RNA, the information of how to make proteins is transferred by a complex machinery called as ribosome. This is made of both protein and RNA. 
and the messenger rna is read to uh, for a code to join something called as amino acids and these individual amino acids will join together to form a protein but there are uh, exceptions who do not follow these rules and these are called as non coding rna which do not make proteins and we'll talk about these later there is also something called as a reverse transcription like we talked about before genome can be either dna or rna so what happens when the genome is rna there is a protein called as reverse transcriptase which will make dna from rna so the process of reverse transcription is where the dna is made from rna using the atgc this protein is called as a rna polymerase and this is essential for uh, viruses such as the sars cov2 virus whose genome is rna and the reverse transcriptase will make dna and from the dna again following the central law of biology more rna and more protein is made so how was protein uh, how do you decide which amino acid will be sitting uh, according to which uh, letter in the dna or rna that is follow, that is following something called as the genetic code now for example if we were to take the genetic sequence this is a dna it is atgc through the process of transcription rna would be made so if you look closely you can see that the sequence is exactly same like the dna sequence but instead of t you have u and i have divided these into three uh, uh, blocks of three that these are called as triplet codons or the genetic code which will decide which amino acid will be coded by three letters so that is done by the process called as translation and for this we need the genetic code for protein synthesis there are about 20 amino acids in a, a, a cell and the names of the amino acids are mentioned on the outside of this and you can see that here you can make the different combination of the rna letters which will decide which amino acids has to be placed for example here auc auc would be isoleucine cug would be leucine gag is glutamic acid and uuc is phenylalanine so we can let's do this together for one dna sequence here i have already divided the dna sequence into triplet codons and this is how the rna will be formed instead of t we will put u in every position so this is how the messenger messenger rna will be formed by the process of transcription now to make the protein we need the chart we have the chart here the first is aug so aug made methionine and uac uac made uac made tyrosine cuu has made leucine gga glycine aga is arginine ucu is serine and for uag it is a stop codon which means that uh, the ribosome will know that the protein uh, the making of the protein has to stop here so uh, from the entire rna the protein will be made and it will be stopped here so this is how a protein is made now we talked about non coding rna which do not follow any of these rules these these are made through transcription but they will not code for proteins uh and they will they are the exceptions to the central law of biology but still they have import, important roles for example there are something called as transfer rnas which are important for making of proteins themselves ribosomal rnas are part of the ribosome which makes proteins and there are also other different types of non coding rna in the cell which has a role of deciding which genes get transcribed and when so if we were to just uh, look at how the genomes are arranged in the case of prokaryotic genome there is something called as operons these are like blocks of genes and they do not have much non coding rna so for example here there is a block of gene gene 1 2 and 3 are here and there are two regions called as promoter and operator here so in an operon there is a continuous stretch of genes which we will uh, which will give rise to a single rna single messenger rna it will start reading from the promoter and from here the entire genes will be made into a single rna and these promoter and operators are called as regulators which decide when these genes have to be made into rna 
And in the case of eukaryotic genomes, however, it's completely different. There is a system called as exon and intron. So each gene is divided into exon and introns. There are many, many regulatory regions. One of them is a promoter, and they also have many, many non-coding RNA. So uh, a eukaryotic genome usually has about 20,000 to 30,000 genes. So unlike the prokaryotic uh, genome where all the genes in an operon will be made together, uh, the 20 or 30,000 genes are not made into RNA together. Instead, each gene will make its RNA separately. And in this case, these introns, so this is an exon and intron. So the gene is made of exons and introns. The intron does not code for protein. So what happens is first, then RNA is made with exon and introns. Then in the introns are like uh, full stops. So you remove the full stops from them. And then you get an RNA where uh, it can be uh, completely changed into a protein. So why are we talking about all this? We started with genetics and genomics, which means that uh, we are trying to understand how genes are uh, set up in a, in a cell so that how it can sustain life. How is uh, How are the genes inherited to its offspring and how is life sustained? So in prokaryotes, the genetic inheritance or the uh, offspring are made by something a process called a simple binary fission. Uh, for example, let's take a bacteria. Here it's a raw bacteria with, with its circular chromosome. It will just uh, ma make more of its cell with, and it will copy its genome, and it will divide it to two, uh, two uh, sister cells. And this is, this is called as a simple binary fission. In the case of eukaryotic cells, there are two different types of cell division and genetic inheritance. First is called as mitosis, where all different cell types, such as cells in our eyes or our skin or our heart, these all divide uh, simply, which is similar to simple binary fission, that process called as mitosis. Another process called as meiosis, where the germ cells, egg and sperm, are made. So, like I said, mitosis is similar to simple binary fission. The major difference is here is that we have multiple chromosomes. So, we have 23, for example, if we were to take human cells, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes, which, we, which has to be copied to make one, uh, uh, one more copy. And then this will be separated with two different cells and it will condense into chromatin and we get packed into a nucleus and make a two, two different sister cells. In the case of meiosis, each cell will only get one copy. It will not get the 23 pairs. It will only get 23 chromosomes. We'll talk about this later. So if we were to look at human cells, there are different types of human cells and we are much more than human. There are about 30 to 100 trillion cells which make up our entire human body. We have about 80 organs and each of them are made of different cell types. For example, the kind of cell which is there in your eyes, not, which is there in your heart, which is not there in your brain, which is not there on your skins, skin cells. So these are completely different and there are about 200 cell types. But there are also about 40 trillion microbes which are present in the human body. We talked about biofilms. So there are different biofilms uh, in the different parts of human body. And these can be different types of microbes. Uh, a simple example would be the biofilm which forms on our teeth when you're asleep. Every day morning, we brush off the biofilm which is formed on our teeth by the different microbes which are present in our mouth. So let's talk about genetic inheritance in humans. So like I said, there are two germ cells, egg and sperm which fuse together to form a new offspring in humans. So uh, the germ cell which comes from females is called as egg. It will only have 23 chromosomes. And from the male, the germ cell which comes is called as sperm. It will also have 23 chromosomes. They will fuse together in a process called as fertilization and it will be, make 46 chromosomes, which will make a full organism. A first stage will be called as embryo and then it will uh, develop into a whole human being. So when did we start thinking about what are genes and how to study genes? It was done by a monk called as Gregor Johann Mendel. He's called as the father of genetics and he used to love studying the heritability of traits in peas. So he used to grow peas in his garden and he used to look at different characteristics or traits called uh, in seed, flower, pod or stem. Uh, what he used to do was take uh, the male germ cells from one plant and put it uh, on the uh, transfer it to a, another plant with the female germ cells. 
here for example if we we took the male germ cells from a white flower he will put it into another plant with purple flowers he'll then grow these beads and see how many plants had purple flowers versus white flowers and this is a photo of uh, or or a drawing of uh, uh, Gregor Johan Mendel who is the father of genetics and it is through his work that we got to know how genes are responsible for characteristics how we look or how we behave and how the genetic inheritance happens so uh, the genetic inheritance is also important to study because there are genetic variations in us not uh, we know that we look different because there are some changes in all of our genes. Uh, when the replication step happens, once in a while, there can be some errors in the genetic sequence, which can lead to a genetic variation, which can lead to different traits or sometimes even disease. For example, this is the genetic sequence we have already seen. Uh, this is the DNA, this is the RNA and the protein. Sometimes during the replication, if there is an error here, for example, the G became a T. The codon became CUU from CUG. But when the uh, ribosome reads through the RNA, the chart would tell that CUU also leads to leucine amino acid, which means that the meaning did not change even though there was a change in the DNA sequence. Such a variation is called as a synonymous variation. But when G is turning to C, the codon changes to CUC from CUG and then the amino acid that will go in there will be called will be proline and such a variation in in the case where the meaning of the protein changed that is called as a non synonymous variation so many many times sometimes these genetic variations can lead to some errors in the cell function and can cause diseases so that's why we want to understand what, what kind of genetic variations are present in us so that we can study diseases as well so let's look at genetic inheritance of disease in humans. So like I said, if there is an error in the gene, it can lead to making of a faulty protein, which can cause the disease. First of all, the cells itself will stop uh, working properly and it can cause, to, cause a disease. So let's talk about autosomal modes of inheritance. So autosomes are the 20, 22 sets of chromosomes other than the sex chromosomes X and Y. And what happens when there is an error in an autosome? So in the case of a normal uh, individual, when both parents have normal genes, uh, no, they'll have both uh, gene copies normal without any errors. The child is born without any disease. But sometimes there are some diseases called as autosomal dominant. Even one parent could have uh, copies of genes which have errors. In this case, if the parent have two copies which have errors, the child might get a, co a gene copy with a mutation or an error which will uh, lead to a disease. And there are other diseases uh, or other mode of inheritance called as autosomal recessive, where the parents might only have one uh, error copy, but when a child gets both uh, uh, co copies with an error, the child can have a disease. The chance here is one in four. So this is how we try to understand how genetic inheritance happens in humans and can lead to diseases. So how can we read the genomes? So like we talked, human genome is about 3.3 billion letters. So it's impossible for us to sit and read through a genome. For that, we have a, a procedure called as genome sequencing. It has many steps. And uh, the first step is you take the genetic material from an individual, you fragment it, you make ma many copies of it through a process called as amplification. And then we read it with a machine called as a sequencer. Uh, and even though the sequencer would give us the 3.3 billion basis, we will not be able to read it. That's when we bring in computers. And through the bioinformatic analysis, we will be able to read through the genome and find if there are any errors. So who tried to read the human genome first? It was called as a human genome project. It happened over 13 years from 1990 to 2003. It cost about 2.7 billion US dollars and it was done by researchers across five different countries. So if you're interested in, to, in understanding what happened in 13 years, you can go to this site and where the different milestones of the Human Genome Project are mentioned. So if so, at the Welcome Collection London, there is an entire printout of the human genome if you wanted to read it by yourself. So it is just ATGC filling all these books. And you can see that for the different chromosome, the number of volumes are different. 
Now imagine you trying to read the genome of every person you know sitting, sifting through these books and trying to find if there is a mistake. And you understand that it's almost impossible. So that is where we bring in our computers and we do bioinformatics so that we can read through these genomes. So in summary, uh, we understood that cell is a unit of life, but the life is sustained through something called as the hereditary genetic material. This can be DNA or RNA. We learned about how there are different genome sizes and how they're organized into a cell and how genetic inheritance can happen. And we understand that it's the genes which decide our traits and our characteristics. And for us to read the genes and the sequence, and if there are any errors, we use something called as genome sequencing. So that's all for this session. I hope this was helpful. Thank you.